I'm Ellen Herman, the faculty director of the Wayne Moore Center for Law and Politics here at the University of Oregon, and I'm delighted that all of you could join us for this talk. The mission of the Wayne Moore Center is to promote civic engagement, inclusive democracy, and justice by bringing together students, scholars, policymakers, activists, members of many communities, in other words, people just like you. We discuss a wide range of issues face, facing Oregon, our nation, and the world, and we work in the tradi tradition of Oregon Senator Wayne Morse, who believed that political independence and education were the building blocks of justice and democracy. This talk by Linda Greenhouse is part of our 2022 a 2023 to 25 series of public events on the theme Defending Democracy. It is supported by the Lorwyn Lectureship on Civil Rights and Civil Liberties in part, and we are very grateful for that. If you aren't already on our mailing list and would like to hear about other events like this one, please do sign up. You can do that on our website just by typing in your email address or there is an old-fashioned piece of paper right outside the door on the table. I'd like to thank my amazing colleagues, the members of the Wayne Moore Center team, Rebecca Dinwoody, Abby Stilley, Dan Titchener, and Christine Waite, our student workers, Camilla Fazal, Emma Gunn, and Kavi Shrestha also are wonderfully helpful. And we are especially grateful to many of you out there in the audience who are members of the Wayne Morse Circle. You provide critical support for our programs through annual donations in any amount, small, medium, or large. And please do consider supporting our work and becoming a Wayne Morse Circle member if you aren't one already. We have been bringing public events like this, not only to the university, but to the broader community for 23 years now, and we hope to do that for many, many decades to come. I'm just going to introduce our speaker very briefly. We are thrilled to have Linda Greenhouse here with us in Oregon speaking on the subject, how the Supreme Court lost the American public. Linda Greenhouse is surely the Dean of Legal Journalists working in the United States, and I suspect she needs very little introduction to many of you who follow the Supreme Court. She covered the Supreme Court for the New York Times literally for decades, and still writes guest essays regularly, I'm certain that some of you at least have read her recent columns about such topics as gun rights and religious freedom cases, um, as well as in particular the many insightful essays she has written about the Dobbs decision and its uh, repercussions, which I suspect will be with us for a long time to come. For her work, she has won many prizes. I'll just mention a couple. She is the recipient of a Pulitzer Prize and the American Political Science Association's Carrie McWilliams Award for major contributions to our understanding of politics. Linda Greenhouse is currently Senior Research Scholar at Yale Law School, so please join me in welcoming her to Oregon. Thank you, Ellen. I'm delighted to see so many people interested in the Supreme Court. If you <laughs> cannot, cannot hear me at any time, please raise your hand. There are people here in charge of the audio, and they can fix that, I think. So <clears throat> not, not so many years ago, there was a poll result that caused people to roll their eyes and shake their heads at the ignorance of the American public. It appeared that more Americans could name the Three Stooges, Larry, Curley, and Moe, by the way, <laughs> than could name three justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. 
Another poll showed <coughs> that while most people could name at least one of Snow White's seven dwarfs, only a minority could name a single Supreme Court justice. And that's a problem, I agree. Democracy depends on the public's basic understanding of how government works and of what role a citizen is supposed to play. So the outcome of those polls, which also showed that a disturbingly large portion of the population could not identify the three branches of government, was taken in some quarters as a sign that things really were on the verge of falling apart. But fast forward to today, and we may be seeing the glimpse of a silver lining. The Supreme Court is so visible these days, playing such a prominent role in the country's political life and in the lives of individual Americans, that I'm quite sure such a poll would come out differently today. Doesn't everybody know Clarence Thomas's name? <laughs> or maybe even the name of his friend who sails him on his yacht and flies him on his private jet? And couldn't many people identify Justice Samuel Alito as the author of the Dobbs decision that erased the constitutional right to abortion? Or if they can't conjure up Alito's name, or maybe not even the name of the decision, surely everybody knows <clears throat> what the court did <clears throat> in that ruling of June of last year. Many people could identify Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the notorious RBG, before she died three years ago. And I think quite a few might mention Justice Sonia Sotomayor, if only for a memoir that was a bestseller in both English and Spanish, as well as for her many books for children. So the silver, <coughs> excuse me, I did a lot of talking this morning and I'm paying the price for it. The silver lining is that many Americans now, I'd venture to say even a majority, have the Supreme Court on their screen and understand at least the essentials of what that does. So that has to be a good development. But of course, behind every silver lining is a dark cloud. And here's the dark cloud. The public doesn't like what it sees. It's as if more the more people know about the Supreme Court, the less they respect it or trust it. For all the years I've been following the Supreme Court, and as Ellen indicated, it's many years. Until recently, it was almost a truism that no matter how low Congress or the, or the White House fell in the public's estimation, the Supreme Court re retained the public's respect. And that was true even in a court-centered crisis like the 2000 election, when by a vote of five to four in Bush against Gore, the justices declared an end to the Florida recount and effectively installed George Bush as president. Many commentators at that time and some of the dissenting justices themselves predicted that the case of Bush against Gore would prove to be a self-inflicted wound from which the court would not be able to recover. But that's not what happened. Political scientists tracked the aftermath of the decision very carefully and found to their surprise that the court did not suffer any lasting damage or actually not much damage even in the short term. Part of the reason was certainly the graceful way that Vice President, Bo Vice President Al Gore conceded the election. But the main reason was that the court, clothed in the symbols of legal authority, literally clothed in robes, floated on a sea of what political scientists call diffuse legitimacy. Meaning that even those people who were disappointed or angered by a particular decision were willing to grant the decision a presumption of validity. They may not like it, but they accepted it. Here's an example. Back in the 1980s, the court decided a case <clears throat> called Hazelwood School District against Kuhlmeyer. Some of you may have heard of this, but probably not many. The question there was whether the principal of a public high school had the right under the First Amendment to censor the school newspaper, or whether students had a right under the First Amendment to publish in the newspaper whatever they wanted to say. The answer to this question was not obvious, and the court was closely divided. The majority held in favor of the principle and ruled that the First Amendment did not extend to student newspaper editors. So a team of political scientists used the Hazelwood case as an experiment. They convened two groups of people, some of who, none of whom had heard of the decision. They told one group, accurately, 
that the Supreme Court had ruled that a public school administrator could censor the school newspaper. What did they think of that? The people in that group easily accepted it. If that's how the Supreme Court interpreted the First Amendment, it must be right. The second group was told that a local school board had adopted that policy, a policy that allowed the high school principal to censor the school newspaper. What did they think of that? The group was skeptical, even critical, of such a policy. The presumption of legitimacy attached to the court's decision, not to a decision made by the political actors on a local school board. So as the Bush, Bush against Gore example shows, the presumption of legitimacy was what political scientists call sticky, hard to dislodge. But it seems that now it's gone. In the aftermath of Bush against Gore, public approval of the Supreme Court remained at or even slightly above 60%, according to Gallup, as compared to down to the 20s for Congress or even lower. It was at 58% as recently as 2020. It plummeted to 40% in September 2021, a record low for Gallup, just after the court refused to block the Texas Vigilante Abortion Law, 6B8, uh, SB8. You remember that law? It was enacted while abortion up until fetal viability was still nominally a constitutional right. And that law purported to authorize anyone anywhere, anywhere in the world to sue a doctor for performing an abortion in Texas after the six week of pregnancy. Unbelievably, the Supreme Court let that obviously unconstitutional law go into effect, putting the country on notice for the Dobbs decision that would come later in that same Supreme Court term. So overall approval plummeted and in fact remains in the low 40s. Within that 40% lies an even more dramatic story, the extreme divergence of views between Republican, Republicans and Democrats. It recently as 2020, there was little divergence between the two, with members of both parties expressing majority support for the court. Now, according to the Gallup poll about six weeks ago, we see a huge divergence. Democratic approval is at 23%, while Republican approval is more than twice that, 56%, independents are hovering around 40. Whether the Supreme Court is a cause of our national polarization or simply its reflection, and that's a nice question, the answer is probably both. These numbers tell a disturbing story. Why disturbing? Why should we care? So my attention was grabbed by a letter to the editor in the New York Review of Books last month the writer was a well-known law professor and political scientist at the University of Texas, Sanford Levinson. And this is what he wrote, <clears throat> quote, it is not a new insight that the most fundamental dilemma of our present time, and not only in the United States, is the decline of any faith in authoritative institutions. Hobbes, King Lear, for that matter, Paradise Lost, speak to us today as much as was the case in the 17th century. From, he goes on, from what comes the authority of Supreme Court justices? Their authority, if they have it, <clears throat> comes from the possession of office rather than from the majesty of non-existent legal science or demonstrable extraordinary ability in thinking like lawyers. He goes on, it's impossible to argue seriously that we the people ever truly consented to the role played by the contemporary court but we must still, as when the motto question authority, which appealed to many of us who grew up in the 60s, becomes a gateway to the Hobbesian nightmare of endless, increasingly violent conflict. Wow. Sandy Levinson is a longtime critic of the court, as well as what he's long regarded as undue public veneration of the constitutional text. I think what he's saying here, though, is that we need government institutions, including the Supreme Court, that most of us can have faith in most of the time, institutions that we can trust. Another legal scholar, Paul Kahn, speaks of the role of trust in his excellent book called Making the Case, The Art of the Judicial Opinion. 
talking about the surprising public acceptance of Bush against Gore despite the fact that the majority in that decision barely bothered to explain itself, Kahn writes, Bush suggests that judicial authority remains even when the narrative fails because he said courts can rely on a reservoir of belief. Where does that reservoir come from, he asks, if a court has failed to prove its case by way of narrative, tell, giving us reasons? To answer that question, Kahn writes, <clears throat> quote, we have to broaden our perspective and ask not just what the opinion says, but who is saying it. Often we're persuaded not so much by an argument, but because we trust the speaker. The same words spoken by a different speaker would not persuade us. Khan goes on, trust might, might be based on character. We trust a person who has, over time, shown himself to have good judgment with respect to issues that matter to us. The same might be true of institutions. And for courts, their past performance has built up an ethos of trust upon which we rely even when we disagree with a particular outcome." Unquote. So how did the public's faith in the Supreme Court evaporate almost overnight? And is there anything to be done by the court or by any other body to get it back? Certainly Dobbs, or more precisely the very public run up to Dobbs, precipitated the plunge. But wasn't the eradication of the right to abortion really more of a match on a pile that was already smoldering? Granted that Dobbs was a huge shock to the system, weren't there earlier signs of fragility that we, by which I include political scientists and sophisticated observers of the court, everybody here, had just missed an earlier erosion of trust in the court? So let's go back to 2020 when Democrats and Republicans shared a fairly robust majority approval of the court. Certainly that wasn't because Democrats and Republicans agreed on everything the court was doing, quite the contrary. Look at the Obamacare cases, look at same-sex marriage. But I think the convergence reflected the fact that each group had enough to like, enough to balance out any systemic dissatisfaction. Nothing about the situation challenge long-held assumptions about the relationship between the Supreme Court and public opinion. In his classic 1957 article on the court as our, as he called it, national policymaker, Robert Dahl described the court as an essential part of the political leadership. As he put it, his, its main task was to confer legitimacy on the fundamental policies of the successful coalition. He emphasized that he meant conferring legitimacy not simply, as he put it, not simply on the particular and parochial policies of the dominant political alliance, but upon the basic patterns of behavior required for the operation of a democracy. The court could accomplish this, he explained further, only if its action conforms to and reinforces a widespread set of explicit or implicit norms held by the political leadership. In other words, according to conventional wisdom, the relationship between the Supreme Court and national politics is a symbiotic one, advantageous to both, inherently stabilizing. That sounds reassuring, but consider the assumptions built into Robert Dahl's 65-year-old construct. What exactly is the current dominant political alliance that the court theoretically reflects when the three justices who nailed down the current conservative supermajority were appointed by a president who failed to win a majority of the popular vote and were confirmed by exceedingly narrow margins in a Senate that itself is grossly malapportioned under a constitution that gives the same number of seats to Wyoming as it does to New York. And what are the prevailing norms that the party in, con in control evokes, either explicitly or implicitly? Certainly not the norm, evidently, that a president has the right to have a Supreme Court nomination considered by the public. That norm is gone. But if that norm was broken by the blockade of President Obama's nomination of Merrick Garland in 20, <coughs> 2016, its replacement was equally violated in 2020 by the confirmation of Amy Coney Barrett while voters were actually going to the polls to cast early votes in the presidential election. Any one of us in this room, I think, would be hard-pressed to name a norm 
that's still standing in this context. I'm reminded of Paul Simon's American tune. One of the lyric, part of the lyric is, I don't know a norm that's not been shattered or driven to its knees. We've seen other less obvious norms shattered as well. Coming out of the crisis of the New Deal in the 1930s, the Supreme Court basically made a bargain with the political system and with the American public. It went something like this. We'll keep our hands off the choices that the political system makes and the priority it sets. No longer will we swoop in to invalidate government regulation of the economy, of the workplace, of the distribution of benefits. We'll reserve our close judicial scrutiny for the protection of discrete and insular minorities, as the 1938 case, Caroline Products case put it. In other words, racial discrimination, later sex discrimination, gets special judicial attention and judges give the rest of the political system a pass. That was nearly a century ago, the 1930s, how time flies. And that settlement held for many decades. That it holds no longer shouldn't be surprising once we recognize that there's no longer a consensus in the country over which groups actually constitute discrete and insular minorities. The new Speaker of the House informs us that Christians are the most discriminated against group in America. And Justice Alito has been saying something very close to that for years. Who are the victims of discrimination? White men? Quite a large segment of the population seems to believe that's true. Others, of course, believe such a claim is nonsensical. There's clearly no agreement on who deserves the court's closest attention. So can it be a surprise that a Supreme Court that upheld the constitutionality of affirmative action in university admissions 20 years ago declared it unconstitutional five months ago. So when a profoundly destabilizing decision like Dobbs arrives, the court's protective insulation has already worn thin. The erosion of the protective layer of trust came both from the outside, from the political forces that created the court we currently have, and from the inside from the court's own behavior and seeming obliviousness to what the public wants and expects from it. Consider these sentences in the penultimate paragraph of Justice Alito's majority opinion in Dobbs. Here's what the man said, quote, we do not pretend to know how our political system or society will respond to today's decision overruling Roe and Casey and even if we could foresee what will happen, we would have no authority to let that knowledge influence our decision." Unquote. Has there ever been a more arrogant or intellectually dishonest statement from a Supreme Court majority? Of course Justice Alito and his allies knew what the response would be to their decision if they hadn't read the polls, which indicated that close to two-thirds of the public did not want the court to overturn Roe. They knew from the public response to the shocking leak of the draft opinion nearly two months earlier. That response, that public response was so angry that the court felt obliged to put up an eight foot tall fence around its <laughs> property to keep the public away. A truly amazing and unnerving sight that lasted for months, the court hiding from its public. And what did Justice Alito mean when he said the court had no authority to take public opinion into account in the face of decades of showing that at its most effective, that's exactly what the court does. Justice Elena Kagan, a dissenter in Dobbs, made this observation speaking a month later at a judicial conference in Montana. Quote, if over time the court loses all connection with the public and with public sentiment, that is a dangerous thing for democracy. A dangerous thing for democracy. And in a subsequent speech, she emphasized how important it was for the public to believe that the court was, as she put it, doing law and not just doing politics. Since there's no real legal analysis in Dobbs, <clears throat> just a projection of religious belief by five justices raised in the Catholic Church, it's hardly surprising that people saw the court as doing something other than law. There was, in Paul Kahn's terms, no narrative except one founded fundamentally on religious belief. 
since that was not a narrative that a majority of the public was prepared to accept, it could persuade only by virtue of public trust in the institution, a trust that had already been worn away. So how did we end up with a Supreme Court so divorced from what the public wants and expects? I've already invoked some recent history in answer to that question, but I think it would be helpful to dig back a few decades. And looking at this audience, I think many of you remember what I'm gonna, <laughs> what I'm gonna say. <clears throat> so the capture of the court uh, during the Trump years, I think was a symptom, not a cause, a description, but not really an explanation. Clearly, we have to take account of contingencies, of historical accidents. For instance, President Jimmy Carter had no Supreme Court nominations during his one term. Although both Presidents Clinton and Obama, and Obama each had two, the replacement of the departing justices with those appointed by those two Democratic presidents didn't drastically change the court's ideological orientation. By contrast, President George H.W. Bush's choice of Clarence Thomas to succeed Justice Thurgood Marshall, and President Trump's selection of Amy Coney Barrett in place of Ruth Bader Ginsburg made a huge difference, and more than 30 years apart went far to creating the court that we have today. But contingency is only part of the story. Early in the decade of the 1980s, let's take our imagination back there, Conservatives were seething in frustration. They had won the presidency twice with Ronald Reagan. They had not won the Supreme Court. Still under the dominance of a center-right coalition of Republican-appointed justices who had stopped for, far short of rolling back the civil rights and criminal justice revolutions of the Warren Court. In fact, there was no evidence then that any of those incumbent justices, with the exception of William Rehnquist, even shared such a goal. And the new president himself was hamstrung by his pledge to place a woman on the Supreme Court. And in the whole country, there was only a tiny handful of sitting female justices and even fewer with Republican credentials. And that small group of women were conspicuously lacking in conservative activists. Sandra Day O'Connor was certainly not a conservative activist. But during the first of Reagan's eight years in office, she was the first, his first Supreme Court nominee because he had made that pledge. As Reagan's second term was winding down, reconfiguring the Supreme Court was an ever more urgent goal. And a well-known conservative intellectual named Robert Bork was to be the vehicle. He gave up his professorship at Yale Law School in order to accept a seat on the DC Circuit, a kind of Supreme Court waiting room. So Bork's moment came in 1987 with the retirement of Lewis Powell, who was the swing justice of his day, his gentlemanly Southern roots belied by his support for affirmative action and for the right to abortion. Replacing him with Bork, an opponent of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, who had denounced as illegitimate the court's recognition of a constitutional right to contraception, let alone abortion, would have changed everything. Not only that, the Reagan revolution was visibly running out of steam by the summer of 1987. The Democrats had recaptured the Senate in the 1986 midterm election. The controversy over the Iran-Contra affair was raging. The administration was visibly weakening. And there was little chance that it could make any progress in Congress on its legislative agenda. It needed the court more than ever. Excuse me. But the Bork nomination proved to be an overreach. After a bruising and lengthy confirmation battle, which included television advertisements for the first time and a week-long televised hearing that held the country riveted, Bork's rejection by a bipartisan coalition was decisive. He got only 42 votes in favor of confirmation. The country decided that Bork was, as his opponents charged, quote, out of the mainstream. And his rejection appeared, in fact, to define the mainstream, acceptance of a constitutional right to privacy, endorsement of the gains of the civil rights movement. <clears throat> Anthony Kennedy confirmed unanimously to the seat intended for Bork, 
rejected the concept of originalism then in its infancy. I'll just digress to say, I'm, I'm sure you're all aware, there's nothing original about originalism. It was made up around this time. And he eventually voted not only to reaffirm the right to abortion, but to write for a majority in the series of gay rights cases up to and including Obergefell, the same-sex marriage case. Progressives could safely turn their attention away from the Supreme Court. The Bork battle was over, except that it wasn't. It simply went underground, carried on by a new generation of conservative activists, many of whom had been barely out of high school at the time of Bork's defeat. They came of age with their eyes fixed on the ultimate prize, the Supreme Court, and they never wavered. When Donald Trump, the candidate, boasted that his Supreme Court appointees would overturn Roe automatically, that sounded like the idle boast of a boastful man, but it proved to be true. And now we see something rare in American history. All the conservatives on the court, all six, were appointed by Republican presidents. Bush one, Bush two, and Trump. And the three liberals were appointed by Democratic presidents Obama and Biden. There are no more David suitors. Remember, no more suitors. Harry Blackman, John Paul Stevens, or to go back further, Earl Warren, William Brennan, both Eisenhower appointees. There's no longer any discontinuity between ideology on the court and the president who brought those individuals to the court. Instead, there's political identity, and in that identity, there's no cover. So where is the court today? A poll issued last year by the Pew Research Center revealed an intriguing <coughs> generation gap in attitudes toward the court. Across all demographic categories, sex, race, education, the single biggest predictor of a negative opinion of the Supreme Court was youth. 63% of those aged 18 to 29 held an unfavorable view of the court. Well, most of those aged 50 and older retained a positive opinion. Well, the Pew researchers didn't offer an explanation for this result. It could be that the memory of the court, that many of us grew up with, sitting benignly above the political fray, still carries weight with older Americans where while lacking such a memory, a cynical younger generation only knows what it sees. That's probably a salutary finding. The romance is over. Romance is fine in interpersonal relations, but it's an obstacle to clear thinking when it comes to institutions. The Journal of the National Academy of Science, Sciences, PNAS, published an interesting article in the summer of last year Three social scientists conducted a longitudinal study of the Supreme Court in relation to public opinion on important and contested subjects. They found that while 10 years earlier the court had reflected the views of the average American, now it reflected the views of the average Republican. That's not really surprising. It comports with what we see. But there was a surprising finding to their study, which was that the Democrats hadn't really noticed. Democrats persisted until Dobbs and holding to an unrealistic view of the court. They didn't recognize it for the conservative engine it had become. And the reason, I think, is clear. It lies in the historic memory, a memory kept alive by the occasional, very occasional, liberal outcomes in cases like Obergefell. It explains why mainstream Democrats failed for so many years to take on the Supreme Court as a political issue. And look what happened while the Democrats were sleeping. For perspective, it's useful to go back to September of 2005 when John Roberts became Chief Justice of the United States. There were five major items on the conservative wish list. Overturn Roe, reinterpret the Second Amendment to guarantee an individual right to gun ownership, get rid of affirmative action, grant religion a place of privilege in the public square, and curb the power of executive branch agencies. Remarkably, the Supreme Court under John Roberts' predecessor and mentor, the very conservative Chief Justice William Rehnquist, had failed to accomplish any of those things. But as of the start of the current term on the first Monday of October, every one of those goals had been achieved. So it could certainly be said that the democratic awakening may have come too late. 
a growing number of people are advocating the abolition of life tenure for Supreme Court justices, a feature of Article Three of our Constitution that's not emulated anywhere else in the world. Well, if life tenure for the Supreme Court was abolished tomorrow by a wave of the hand, it would take, by one estimate I recently read, until 2047 for all the incumbent justices to be replaced by those with limited terms. There is no quick fix for the court we have. So I'm often asked, and we're about to get to the Q&A portion of our time, and you're gonna ask me, what can we do? Isn't there a way to change the trajectory that the Supreme Court is on? I don't have an easy answer, but I do have some answers. Now that we've learned that the court is not going to solve our problems, we need to turn our attention away from the court and toward other institutions of government and of civil society. Those who are dissatisfied with the performance of the Senate on judicial confirmations have to start cultivating the next generation of political leadership, starting from the very local level Senate candidates don't fall out of the sky. In our federal system, states have great power and state legislatures really matter, as we know here in this state. We're seeing that play out day after day. Yet how many of us can even name our state legislature, legislators or the members of our state Supreme Court? These individuals didn't arrive in the state capitol on a magic carpet. We need to pay attention, sustained attention. That takes work. It takes collective effort, as modeled by the voters in Ohio earlier this month, and that's called democracy. So I started this talk by saying that public disenchantment with the Supreme Court has a silver lining, greater knowledge of the court, greater understanding of the power it holds over us. In a democracy, after all, knowledge is power. In my reporting career, I often said that I saw my job as not telling my readers what to think, but empowering them with the knowledge to think for themselves, to come to their own informed conclusions about the events that I was chronicling. I hope I've done a bit of that here today, and I thank you for listening. You're part of the conversation. I'm happy to uh, field questions. Okay. Maybe introduce yourselves. <laughs> um, how do you do? I'm Margie Paris, and I was a faculty member at the University of Oregon Law School, and I'm delighted that you're here. So many of us came to the law through the development of the Federalist Society, which you mentioned, and um, the development of the quasi-originalist um, philosophy. You didn't mention that as, uh, as one of the factors that contributed to the court losing its public, but I wonder if what you would say about the power of originalism to remove from the public the confidence that the court is taking their views into account. Yeah, so what about the power of originalism? So, I mean, what to say about originalism? As I, as I said kind of in passing, <coughs> it's not original. I mean, there's no evidence that the framers really thought that every word they said was going to be interpreted 250 years later by the you know, public meaning. There's public meaning originalism. There's textual originalism. And it's, it's really, uh, you know, it was invented in the 1970s along with the rise of Ronald Reagan by the Heritage Society and other you know, right-wing foundation-supported groups as a way of um, taking back constitutional law. And uh, it was a power play, but it's a very powerful one because for the public at large, it sounds totally legitimate. Of course, we want to interpret the Constitution the way it's supposed to be interpreted by those who wrote it, and we don't want judges running around the country making stuff up. So it, rhetorically, it was an absolutely brilliant move uh, 
functionally, it allowed a power grab by the Supreme Court and allowed the court, look at the Heller decision in, in 2008, the Second Amendment decision, allowed the court to say, oh, you know, the, the, the rather muddled and, and incomprehensible words of the Second Amendment, uh, here's what the original understanding was. Well, you know, that case was five to four and actually was fought out on the grounds of originalism. The battle there between Justice Scalia for the five and Justice John Paul Stevens for the four, they, they debated on the grounds of originalism and Scalia had, had the votes. Um, so it's, it's, it's a tricky and dangerous, but uh, you know, easy selling concept and uh, yeah, the, you mentioned the Federalist Society. I mean, they've been they've been a big proponents in their public facing work of um, you know propounding this, and we're all living with the consequences. Roberta Mann, I'm on the faculty here, and. Uh, if you could talk into the mic, I could hear you. Roberta Mann, faculty member. So, um, Linda, thank you so much for being here. And I was really struck by what you said about how we need to be informed. We need to be informed to protect democracy. How would you advise, oh, how, how would you advise us to become informed given the loss of so many local newspapers? Do you have advice for us? How can we be informed, given that? Because that's obviously very important for learning about local democracy. Well, um, there's a lot, for, for people that want to spend the time and effort to keep up with the court, uh, there's actually a lot of online resources in addition to you know reading the New York Times or the Washington Post or whatever. Um, uh, you know, you could follow a website called SCOTUS blog. So SCOTUS is Supreme Court of the United States, it's an acronym. <clears throat> SCOTUSblog.com, I think it is. Um, they cover every decision. Uh, you can look at the court's own website, which is surprisingly good. Uh, they post um, every case as it comes in, all the briefing, all the briefs are posted. Um, the opinions are posted as soon as they're issued. The, they live stream the audio now. Uh, they put up the transcript of the arguments the same day. Um, there, are, you know, there are ways to, to pay close attention to the court. It takes work. Um, it's what I mostly spend my days doing, and we don't all have the luxury of, 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 of doing that. But. Um, uh, you know, you might want to set aside some time every week to say, okay, what did the court do this week? And, and look on SCOTUS blog or look, you know, look on other websites. And there's another good website called um, How Appealing that deals mostly with, it's an aggregator of um, cases that are making their way up to the court. And then when the court decides something, it aggregates a lot of um, commentary, journalism, and academic commentary about the decision. Um, and these are free websites. How appealing is, I, I look at actually a couple times a day. Um, so those are just some ideas. Just to follow up quickly on the point that Roberta made, is there something about the loss of local newspapers, newspapers at the local level? Um, at, Local, yeah, local, and the coverage of local affairs, public affairs. I mean, it was 175 years ago that Alexis de Tocqueville made this observation about American democracy, about the role of newspapers in particular. So as a journalist, do you think, you know, the internet makes everything feel, you know, immediately available, but is there something about that local coverage and institution that, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a huge problem. I mean, I, I live in, in New Haven, uh, which used to have, New Haven, Connecticut, used to have um, two thriving daily newspapers. Now it has one kind of, I don't know, struggling uh, 
newspaper owned by some hedge fund. So, um, so a nonprofit website called um, uh, the New Haven Independent has grown up and has very robust local coverage and um, you know, is supported by people who give donations and, and so on. Um, same thing that's kind of happening all over the country. Um, there's a whole movement to um, turn newspapers into nonprofits. The Philadelphia Bulletin did that um, a couple of years ago. So, I mean, there is a major problem. Um, uh, and there's a lot of, you know, work going into trying to ameliorate, not, not cure it. The problem is not going to be cured because the, the economics of local journalism have evaporated. But um, there are creative ways. There's a um, foundation-funded project called Report for America which will pay um, half the salary for uh, reporters to be hired by local papers um, in a kind of a you know, shared enterprise. So there's a lot of interesting things going on, but your, your point is obviously well taken. I mean, it's, it takes work to find out what's going on in the local community because it doesn't come on your doorstep uh, every afternoon. I'm, Dan I'm Daniel Pope, a retired history professor here, and you've persuaded me, I've already been persuaded, that uh, term limits are too slow and too ineffectual. What about expansion of the number of justices? And why don't the Democrats pick up on that and try to run with it? Yeah, I mean, it was a lot of energy um I think going into the 2022 midterms, uh, expand the court, <clears throat> um, which would take a, you know, filibuster-proof majority in both houses, and it proved not to be realistic. Um, you know, I've been kind of agnostic about it because even assuming Democrats had the power to add two seats, or some people say four seats, and the worm turns and Republicans come in and they add another two or another four. And um, it's, I, it's, never, it's never grabbed me as a solution. Um, but, you know, people I have high regard for think it is a solution. So it's, it, it, it's all theoretical because it, it, can, it can happen in our current politics. Hi, I'm Kamala Sugar. I'm a local circuit judge. I was very interested to hear um, your take on the importance of the um, trust in the judiciary. It's something that and, and the, with. the importance of the what? Trust in the judiciary. It's something that we grapple with every day. Um, but I, I, as I listened to your recitation of the history of the erosion of the public trust, I wanted to hear you talk a little bit about the impact of the Citizens United decision on democracy? So I think the impact of Citizens United, I mean, Citizens United has become an image rather than what it actually did. You know, it removed uh, limits on independent spending by corporations and by labor unions. Um, the whole, the, the, the dark money and the super PACs and all that, that came later. That wasn't inherently part of Citizens United. So I think when we say Citizens United, we mean a whole series of, of opinions that came down. And um, yeah, I think, I think part, of the, part of the deal in Citizens United, if you read the Kennedy opinion, was okay, we're, we're unleashing this unlimited spending, but don't worry because we're going to have accountability through disclosure of where the money's coming from. That hasn't happened. And the Supreme Court having uh, weaponized the First Amendment to say that uh, you have a First Amendment right 
to spend your money privately and not be accountable and not, you know, anonymously rather. Um, that on top of Citizens United itself is, has, has greatly exacerbated that problem. And, um, you know, we don't know where the dark money is coming from. And that, um, that's a problem. It's a serious problem. Not, not, not too much, given the current court and the, uh, as I say, the weaponization of the First Amendment, I don't see any way out of it right now. Hi, my name is Eric Fisher. I'm just a citizen. Um, my question, how should the ethics code have been written? How, how should the ethics code? Have been presented. How should it have been made for us in, on the subject um, you're discussing? Yeah, today? It's, you know, it's good to have an ethics code, but um, uh, <laughs> but you know, it really depends on um, having ethical people in these in these positions. So, um, you know, a code on paper um, is only as good as the willingness of. Uh, you know, the individuals to abide by it. And, you know, what I try to remind people is there, there's a kind of fundamental misunderstanding um, of the situation. The Supreme Court has had an ethics code uh, in black letter federal law since Watergate. It's called the Ethics and Government Act. It applies to the Supreme Court just like it applies to all the courts. And it requires disclosure of your finances, a disclosure of your travel, and all these things. The problem was certain justices just weren't following it. Um, so, you know, the well, it became politicized and there was a public demand, you need an ethics code. Well, you know, so they beefed it up a little bit. And, um, you know, now that I think they know they're under a great deal more scrutiny, I think some of those lapses will not recur. But, um, uh, you know, as I said, I mean, the code doesn't fix it. We need, the, we need people who are guided by a, a sense of uh, propriety and, and, and principle. And if we don't have that, no code in the world can fix that problem. Uh, I'm Rick Friedrich, also a citizen. And, uh, Certainly, uh, the Supreme Court has moved dramatically uh, in an anti-democratic uh, direction, and uh, it would seem like the use of the shadow docket is a really serious problem. Do you have some thoughts about that? Yes, his, his reference was to something called that's known as the shadow docket, which is, um, do people know about this? They, okay. Some yes, some no. <clears throat> so every court has what they call an emergency docket. Things come up, the court has to act. They can't spend a year you know, granting a case and taking briefs and having oral argument and you know, whatever. Um, so there's nothing inherently wrong with having an emergency docket where the court can act you know, right away and respond to emergency demands. What happened during the Trump years is that uh, the Trump administration would come in and um, uh, ask the court to intervene in its favor and this, that, and the other thing that were not really emergencies, but kind of shortcut uh, the necessity of going through the usual process. And the court was um, you know, opening its doors to the Trump administration and granting these emergency applications. And, and so this came to be known as the shadow docket. It's not transparent. Things would happen in the middle of the night. The public would have no way of knowing that even things were cooking. Um, and the court took a, has taken, uh, correctly, a lot of grief for uh, its, its behavior. Um, the last 18 months or so, the court has kind of held back on uh, making major moves on the shadow docket. So, you know, people that follow this think that maybe the court got a message. 
um, from the Legal Academy and from uh, Congress, the Senate Judiciary Committee held hearings on this. And so there's, there's less of the shadow docket going on right now. Um, so, you know, it's, it's much worth watching. It's kind of a, a work in progress to see whether the court can uh, restrain its impulse to throw its weight around in this, in this way. But, um, but during the pandemic, it was very notable. The court did a lot of important work um, uh, through its use of the shadow DACA that was very, very disturbing. My name is Pablo, and I'm uh, visiting my hometown of Eugene. Okay, sorry about that. And uh, my name's uh, my name's Pablo, and I'm visiting my hometown of Eugene. And thank you so much for your luminosity, Linda. Um, curious, what a couple things. Um, one, if there have been any surprises for you with the recent conservative justices, have they any surprises? Have they been unexpectedly more conservative or less, or any of the stories? I mean, like Neil Gorsuch sort of surprised, I think, a few people on a couple of the recent decisions. And then secondly, have you seen the documentary about Kavanaugh and your reaction to it and that confirmation process? So the question is, have I seen, have I been surprised by anything the conservative justices have done? Um, no, actually, <laughs> no. Um, I mean, if the, if, if your implication is do I see any signs that they're kind of, uh, quote, evolving in a less conservative way? No. Um, I mean, I'm a little surprised that, um, I was pretty surprised that Amy Coney Barrett, having come to the court um, encumbered by our knowledge that she had devoted her adult life to anti-abortion activities, when she voted with Alito and Dobbs, uh, didn't say anything. That she didn't explain herself, you know. Alito wrote, Thomas wrote, Kavanaugh wrote, Roberts wrote. She was just quiet. She just gave Alito her vote quietly. And I was surprised that she didn't feel um, a kind of obligation to, to explain where she's coming from. But, um, that was not a happy surprise. <laughs> so, yeah. About the Kavanaugh, and, Kavanaugh documentary. Have you seen the, Ka the Kavanaugh documentary? It was a Sundance film. I'm a, I'm a screenwriter, novelist. Um, um, have I see seen the Kavanaugh documentary? Uh, I get. Uh, I think I was. I involved. I, I, there was a period where, like, I was involved in documentaries like every week, and I've lost track of them, and I haven't watched them. So. Um, so, so, no. Kitty Piercy, and uh, my question builds on another one. You talked about ethics, uh, a paper about ethics is just a paper. You have to have some ethics for that to work. And my question is, I think the public thinks the Supreme Court is the highest court, and there's no way to hold them accountable. And I want to hear from you, what can the public do to hold the Supreme Court accountable? Um, you know, I mean, there was some very good journalism that brought the ethical lapses to light. And, uh, you know, we wouldn't know about it except for Politico and some reporting by the New York Times um, and uh, ProPublica, which is a, you know, nonprofit um, website. So, you know, we, we, the individual members of the public, really, I can't stand here and say there's anything for us to do. Um, but, you know, support these, uh, efforts, journalistic efforts, to give us the knowledge we need to come to our judgment about what we think is happening. My name is Isabel Papagno, and I'm a citizen, too. Put it up to my mouth. My name is Isabel Papagno, and I am a fellow citizen. 
can a Supreme Court justice be impeached? Let me come closer so I can. Okay. Can a Supreme Court justice be impeached? Yes. How does it start? <laughs> the Constitution provides that a Supreme Court justice can be impeached along with every other um, high official in the government and um, people may remember back in the 60s, there were lots of yard signs, impeach Earl Warren, right? I mean, impeach William O. Douglas, that was a effort that the later President Gerald Ford initiated in, in Congress. So, so theoretically, yes. Uh, there have been other, there have been federal judges who've been impeached. Um, you know, the kind of uh, public understanding that's developed through American history is that you don't impeach judges for um, their judicial acts. You impeach them for criminal behavior, for some kind of, you know. Uh, I'm Tricia Hedin, I'm a citizen. Um, just following up on that, Two questions. You talked about the Ethics in Government Act. Is there any enforcement piece of that act? And the, uh, other, the other is, do the justices belong to a bar association that has any uh, responsibility and authority to sanction them? So for the lower courts, there, there is an enforcement mechanism. Um, each federal circuit has a judicial council that people can bring complaints to and uh, sets up an investigation. Um, and that's happened, you know, quite recently with some lower court judges. Um, there's a big debate going on as to what Congress can do within the constitutional framework and imposing some enforcement mechanism on the Supreme Court. And that debate is unresolved. Uh, you know, uh, Justice Alito said, not too long ago, the Congress has no authority over the court. That is not correct, and Justice Kagan corrected him publicly. Um, so you can get a good debate going, and there are efforts um, in the Senate Judiciary Committee to craft some kind of enforcement, um, some kind of effort for people to bring complaints and that sort of thing, and it's. As I say, so it's a, it's a work in progress. We haven't, we have not heard the end of this. Do they belong to a bar association? Do they belong to a bar association? I, I, I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Do they belong to a bar association? Do they, yes. The members of the um, Supreme Court? I assume they do, yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm a freshman here. My name is Dan. I remember you from class this morning. Oh, oh really? So. Uh, I sure will. Uh. Hi, so um, I'm curious about uh, the main obligation of the Supreme Court. Talk into the mic. Sorry, sorry. So yeah, I'm not a professional singer. I'm not so used to this. Um, OK, OK. You want to hear me? OK. So, um, you spoke about originalism, right, and how it's not very original. And you also spoke about, uh, in, in Dobbs, how there was very little legal analysis of the laws and how um, what Alito said was not really based in legal thought or constitutional uh, precedent. What I'm wondering is um, if there is a stark difference between uh, what the Constitution says about a certain law or certain acts, right, and the public opinion, what ought the Supreme Court to do in that situation? Should it forego uh, constitutional amendments, right? Take a more, um, I don't know, progressive approach, I guess is what some people would say, or should it uphold the public opinion, or should it uphold um, constitutional precedent and forego public opinion? Well, I think you, you, you have framed a kind of either or, uh, you know, question, and I think uh, things are not that clear.
clear. Um, you know, I think history tells us that the court functions at its best when it's informed by public opinion, but not bound, not slavishly bound to, you know, look at the Gallup poll for what, what we should do today. Um, I, I, it's a much more dynamic process between the 